excuse me, could you tell me where I might get a cup of tea? Excuse me? Mm -hmm. Oh, excursi. Tauts Franz excursi us Rigas. 18th of November. Thanks. Sometimes something as simple as asking the way can become so difficult. A change of language, a change of location. It can be very disorienting. Certainly, we prefer to have familiar things around us. We naturally enjoy a sense of belonging. The clothes, the furniture, the houses, even the skyline. And all these things usually reflect the location and the way of life that is lived there. But can one country just become like another? Or to put it another way, is culture transferable? And what is culture anyway? And what is its influence on appropriate design? Well, that's what we're going to explore in this program. We'll be looking at what is and what isn't international in design, be it clothing, furniture, electronic products, cars, hotels, holiday souvenirs, and even signs. And we'll look at the clues to watch for when design changes from place to place and from country to country. Let's take it one step at a time and begin by looking at this term, culture. The word culture can mean many different things. We actually call some people cultured. It's quite a compliment. It implies that they're aware of a breadth of attitudes and thoughts which are well-developed and offer a mature and sensitive outlook. Yet, historically, we've applied the term culture to groups of people based on their religion, tribal customs, architecture, social practices, and even the colour of their skin. More recently, we've established subcultures, sometimes simply based on the clothing people wear, or even a particular taste in music. Generally, then, culture is used to distinguish particular patterns of life and lifestyle. So in many ways, culture is a means by which we show how different we are from each other and also how much we're the same. What that means for design is that the things that influence our lifestyle are often the very same things that affect design. Things such as climate, geography, social norms and customs, technological development, available resources, density of population and historic evolution. So let's first look briefly at the cultural influences on design in Canada. This is a remarkable country. The second largest in the world, but only the 32nd highest population. The climate can vary by as much as 80 degrees annually, with most of us living in a narrow band about 400 kilometers wide and over 6,000 kilometers long that can be described loosely as temperate. Add to this the diversity of terrain, offering either enormous watered areas, huge areas for farming, or the most severe of mountain ranges. Canada also possesses enormous natural resources. If we also consider the ancestry of the Canadian people, coming from all parts of the world, together with the native peoples who were here in the first place, then we can see a wide range of major influences on Canadian lifestyle and culture. And although the population has grown sixfold in the last 100 years, communication by road and rail still has to deal with abnormally long distances. So in designing for the Canadian culture, let's start by considering the size of the country and the huge distances we have to cope with. For example, let's examine this box. It's big and probably heavy. It says that the contents are fragile, so we've got to handle this thing with some care. And if we have to transport a box like this halfway across Canada, it will undoubtedly be costly. And that fact alone will have a direct effect on the design of products. Let me explain. Highly finished products need careful handling. After all, no one wants to buy something that's chipped or dented. If it is delicate or has a refined finish, then it will need highly developed, specially designed packaging, especially if it's to be transported long distances. In many instances, the packaging itself has to be designed and tested to see if it will withstand the shocks, bumps and bruises of transportation. This box contains a domestic appliance, in this case, a fridge. Usually, appliances are made up of a mixture of metal and plastic components, and they tend to be bulky because washing machines, dryers, refrigerators, dishwashers and ovens all contain large, empty volumes inside them. This means that we will be also transporting air, and that all the clever, valuable technological bits will be around the outside, where they're quite vulnerable to damage. 
So if a manufacturer were to ship an appliance, say, 3,000 kilometres, only to have it returned back 3,000 kilometres because of a dented panel or a non-functioning motor, the costs could be prohibitive. It is therefore not surprising that for these kinds of items in North America, sturdiness and reliability are essential and with very long lifespans. Repairs, if necessary, are achieved by sub-assemblies. A new part, easily available through a service centre, could be fitted either by a trained local repairman or even by yourself, if you have the right tools. No need to ship the whole appliance all the way back to its manufacturer. Now, to develop that kind of reliability is demanding on design. And it isn't surprising, then, that in North America, there isn't really a great variety in these major appliances. Oh, there may appear to be a range, but the differences are mainly visually cosmetic. The functional differences are minimal. But marketing and advertising people can't let buyers think that everything stays the same. So, each year they advertise a brand new model, except it is often only the superficial parts that change. We are asked to throw away last year's model and buy this year's. Mind you, if they really did change the whole product each year, the manufacturing costs would be enormous and the reliability less predictable. So we see so many ugly stoves in second-hand stores because although they still work, they were no longer visually acceptable to their owners. Now, European design of similar appliances is different because the same marketing influence never occurred and distance and reliability were not necessarily the chief concerns. Distances in Europe are less, so repairs and replacement are less costly. So the sub-assembly approach to design has never really caught on in Europe because it never needed to. Concerns are more toward energy efficiency uh, because energy is more costly in Europe. Oh, and one other thing, size. Size is also related to another cultural influence, density of population. North America generally has a population density of about 1 40th of that in Europe and 1 50th of the population density in Asia. So space isn't as much of a problem here. Also, North American fridges need to be bigger because we have to put a lot in them. Fresh foodstuffs can be available throughout the year in Europe without the need for elaborate packaging and refrigerated transportation. But in Canada, with its short growing seasons, severe winters and reliance on imported foodstuffs, packaging designed for shipping and refrigeration is essential. And so, therefore, are big fridges. For example, the average North American fridge contains about 14 cubic feet, about 0.5 cubic metres of space, whereas in Europe it's about 6 cubic feet, 0.2 cubic metres, or even as low as 4 cubic feet, a mere 0.13 cubic metres. In recent years, the Canadian population has increased and urban communities have become more densely populated. So there is more and more interest in European and Japanese designs. So we're starting to see appliances like this for stacking in small spaces. Similar evidence can be found in the parking lot. In North American cities, we see more and more compact cars because now there's less space and compact cars are lighter and therefore more fuel efficient. Japan had to learn to design like that years ago. When Japanese companies started to export around the world, they offset high transportation costs by shipping fewer models, cars that had everything, no optional extras. But with the rising costs of Japanese labor and world transportation, the Japanese are now building assembly plants in countries to which they previously exported. Consequently, they can modify the designs to suit the demands of each country. For instance, right-hand drive cars are assembled in England, Australia and Hong Kong, and body parts with extra corrosion protection are produced in Canada. Canada, for its part, exports large quantities of wood products. In the construction industry, Canadians use available woods such as cedar, pine and spruce, which are excellent for coping with the extreme nature of the severe Canadian climate. From cedar shingles to pine or spruce framing, Canadians have gained such extensive expertise in wood that now we even export our wood frame technology to Japan. But pine and cedar aren't ideal for all furniture making. Although pine will harden with age, it's still light and relatively soft. So furniture made in pine and cedar tends to be bulky. 
Now, many people like the look of pine in their homes, but primarily this furniture is best suited for cottages or ranches or generally the outdoors. Furniture for inside the house must be appropriate to daily use and abuse, and so is best made from woods like birch, maple, ash and oak. These are hardwoods and tend to be from slower growing trees, which are not available in large enough quantities in Canada to satisfy all our furniture needs. This is the same for many other countries. So that is why furniture has become an internationally designed product. In fact, the lack, and thus the high cost of hardwoods around the world, has forced all countries to explore other materials for the design of furniture. We see the use of a wide range of materials as substitutes for and appropriate alternatives to the hardwoods. For example, steel tubing, veneered chipboard, plastics and reinforced composites. And we also see the use of fabrics such as nylon or cotton or canvas. And the use of alternatives has given rise to the phenomenon of knock-down furniture. All this furniture looks fairly permanent but it's all knocked down. In other words, it was designed to come to pieces. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but obvious clues are screws or bolt heads, unlike more permanent furniture where joints are glued and concealed. Because screws, though strong, are really temporary fasteners. So if you see them in a piece of furniture, the chances are it's a knockdown down product, a one that could be taken apart again. There are, though, other clues that suggest that these are knockdown down items. Flat planes and square edges seem to dominate, and this shelf system is made up entirely from flat planes, because in its knockdown or unbolted state, it forms a rectangular package, which is convenient for transport, not only to the store and to your home, but also when you move. One of the consequences of this is that these panels can be made of laminated and veneered chipboard, a kind of composite having many advantages over wood. It's a very economical way of using otherwise waste sawdust and glue to form a new material. In other words, if we'd had lots of hardwood trees, we wouldn't have the same kind of furniture, and probably not as much laminated chipboard, cause and effect. However, designers have become very creative in developing knockdown furniture. This approach is so common now that there's a whole range of hardware components designed especially for this use. It comes from Europe where the need was established long ago for fast-changing communities. The result is that furniture is quicker and cheaper to make and more portable. And with the extremes of humidity variation, especially inside Canadian homes from summer to winter, knockdown furniture tends to be more stable. It won't warp or twist. In fact, it's an example of international design ideally suited to Canadian needs. North Americans travel widely but we often like to take the symbols of our culture with us. So much so that it has spawned another sort of internationally designed product, the International Hotel. For example, the Holiday Inn prides itself that no matter what country you visit, there will always be a Holiday Inn. They will speak English, and the rooms, the food, the showers, the beds, the TV, and the decor will be almost the same as back in North America, a home away from home. Imagine how difficult this must be to achieve. The architecture, the building materials, the foodstuffs, the decor. But it works, or it has been made to work. But obviously there are still some subtle differences between a Holiday Inn in China and in the Bahamas. McDonald's do the same thing, taking a successful North American concept all over the world, even to Russia. The Chinese restaurant, too, is a very commonplace site anywhere in the world, with some differences from country to country. Oh, for example, chop suey was invented in North America, not China. In other words, Chinese food is always Chinese, but with variations to accommodate different eating styles. Plates instead of bowls, cutlery instead of chopsticks, all made with slight variations, the same but different. We can stay with this international theme and look at something else that is internationally enjoyed. Music and its impact on the design of products, such as stereo equipment. Not surprisingly, all this equipment looks the same all over the world. Radios, Walkman, record players, cassette players, 
CD players. You see, when everyone around the world can use the same items, then good economic design can advance in leaps and bounds. Standardization of LPs, cassettes, CDs, and the electronic equipment they are used with makes for the possibility of very economical products. And they have, in a short time, become mature products, because we know how to make them work efficiently, like TVs and stoves. Mature products with standardized internal electromechanical workings. So every detail can be the same almost anywhere, except one the instructions for using it. These days we often have trouble making things work because such devices have lots of buttons, some concealed and some with words on or beside them that we, we don't even understand. The problem occurs simply because of too much internationalism. Here's what I mean. Each one of these dots on this large silicon wafer is a tiny circuit board. They're called IC chips. They're made in vast numbers, and they have miniaturized and standardized electronic entertainment devices worldwide. But it costs a lot of money to design and produce one chip, so it's proven to be more economical to design all the chips to have all the possible features. So most similar products, VCRs and the like, have identical chips in them. That's economically justified standardization. Manufacturers hook up only the features they require, at different models hook up more and more features. So suddenly we have features we don't use often or at all. Features we don't even understand. The products have in the meantime become smaller still with more and more buttons with less and less room for labels. Oh, like furniture, the instructions can be pictorial for electrical products, but it's more difficult. That means we have to become electrical product literate and all because of this international, cost-effective standardization. But here is one international success, something that doesn't seem to need too many instructions. The piano. There are no instructions, no labels. An evolved product. Three pedals here, and a regular pattern of black and white keys. And this is a truly international product. You see, a piano is made up of a range of specialized components, in turn, made from very specialized materials. This piano uses felt for the hammers from England, strings from Germany and Japan, a cast frame from Austria, wood from North America, and it's all assembled in Korea with technical assistance from Germany. Now, that is cost-effective internationalism, relying on getting the best of everything from the most appropriate place, leading to an appropriate design. So the lesson for designers and we the users is not to think of a product as a whole, but of the function of the components, the materials, the technology, transportation. Internationalism can, however, also result in ironic circumstances. Let me explain. The one time we eagerly want to buy something foreign is when we go abroad on trips or vacations. Souvenirs are big business, and they have to be designed too. But this uh, Canadian mug was made, as it says on the bottom, in English, made in Korea. Uh, this one, made in China. This, made in Canada. And this one, made in England. Hmm. So what's the sense in this? Is this so wrong? Well, to explain that, we must realise that there are several kinds of souvenirs, and therefore a few different things to consider when passing judgement on the appropriateness of their design. For instance, this mug is a memento, a functional reminder, a useful gift. The name Canada on the side acts like a little flag, reminding the user that it was bought in Canada. Or it's a pity that it wasn't made there, but that's one kind of souvenir, and lots of people buy them to remind them of a special vacation or trip. Besides, it was designed in Canada. Now, we could look for some special material that only exists locally, like silk from Thailand or precious stones in South America, leather from Morocco, and try to find a souvenir that's made out of it, designed locally, if you like. But this may have some disadvantages. For example, just because the raw material is there doesn't mean that there is, in the same place, the appropriate craft or manufacturing skill to match it. South America is noted for its precious stones and jewels, not necessarily for its jewellery. 
and many people have bought goods made of leather in countries where the tailoring skill and the quality of the thread haven't matched the quality of the leather. So it's often best to bring the raw material back home or even get it made up in another place where they are best equipped to do it. And there are other things to consider before one decides on the appropriateness of the design of a souvenir or gift. I mean, what good is a wallet that isn't big enough for your, your driving license? Or clothing that doesn't match the climate you live in? Perhaps the commonest reflection of national culture and internationalism can be seen in our clothes. In much of Canada, spring and fall are short seasons. Summers are hot, winters are severe. So with this broad range of climates, clothing designed in Canada tends to vary with the extremes. Now, some clothing can be quite particular to certain parts of the world, but in the design of clothing for people in large cities, there are extensive similarities internationally because the climate variants are more easily dealt with in cities. We tend to be more protected. We travel in cars and buses, work in climate-controlled buildings and are sheltered in our homes, living most of our lives at just above room temperature. So it gets harder to tell where someone is from just from the clothes they wear. On the other hand, I'm not going to wear this. Or this. Not because I don't want to, but because they don't fit the climate in Canada. Or they don't match my beliefs and customs. There, that's more comfortable. Even when our cultures are similar, language can be a major problem to designers of internationally available products. Now, before worldwide travel and cars, we traveled more slowly. 80 years ago, this street corner looked like this. We used landmarks that didn't change to tell us where we were. Now, they're hidden, or they've disappeared altogether. Today, we travel much faster around our cities. We need signs of the right size to enable us to make the right decisions at the right time. If we can't, then for the driver, it could be stressful or even dangerous. For the international driver, it's a potential disaster. Fortunately, we do have some international signs, like this red octagon, which of course means stop, or green, amber and red for stoplights. In general, the use of symbols and colours is becoming more familiar, but a symbol relies on consistency of use and interpretation. For instance, the red circle with a diagonal stripe means that you cannot do something, like make a right turn. But the same shaped arrow on a yellow warning diamond doesn't mean you can turn right if you're careful. It means the road makes a sharp right turn. This sign means no cycling, so does this sign warn you of riderless bicycles? And does this sign request you not to jump over the cyclists? Now, this is a warning for bumps in the road, but it could mean you are entering an industrial area. In England, this sign warns that elderly people may be crossing, but some people think it's a warning against pickpockets. And how about this sign, prominent on a major highway into Montreal? I have no idea what it means. Clearly, we need symbols, but unless these symbols are internationally understood, then they could be worse than words in a strange language. So designers must be careful to use appropriate and consistent graphic design. So culture, once considered to be only based on tradition and religion, really has many other facets too. For the designer, it's not easy. Designing for local known markets is challenging enough. Designing for other parts of the world carries with it the responsibility to consider things like language, uh, availability and suitability of materials, tradition and the systems that products must relate to, shipping costs, repair, storage, packaging, and of course, the climate. So, although my backpack was made in uh, Korea, remember it was designed for Canada. So I know it makes sense. Pity it doesn't say where it was designed on the label though. Oh well. In the next programme, I'll be looking at waste, the throwaway and obsolescence to see what sense we can make of that and how that influences appropriate design, both in Canada and the rest of the world. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you tell us where we get the ferry dock? Ah, now that's fairly easy, yeah. See, look, if you hold it this way, you can say that we're about there, I guess. We go over to that road down there, down there, you know, all the way down, about a mile and a quarter. It's down there, it should take you about 20 minutes or so, yeah, yeah.